Hi, I'm Jason, the creator of The Grey Rooms. Firstly, hello and welcome. I know it has been a quiet off-season, and if you are like me, you are more than likely itching for something new. But we have just a cure for that itch. Last season, we asked for entries into a contest for a featured story, and we received a bunch of submissions. One thing I noticed was that we had a few entries from authors that had never written anything before. So we felt it would be something kind of cool to give back to the talented authors community by giving someone a chance to have their story professionally performed and fully produced by us here at the Grey Rooms. We thought it would be a cool idea to conclude every season with a produced story from a first-time author. So thus begins a tradition. Our first first-time author is none other than Christina Wilson. You probably recognize that name. Well, you should. She played Lucy in the main season. That's right. This is a tragic and sobering story of heartache by Christina. This is her first work ever in the genre and our first ever first-time author production. So please, sit back and enjoy this story voiced by Warren Richardson and Patrick Mealy. Enjoy. Sanctuary. It's not fair. I know, son. I need her. I need her, too. She'll always be with us, Carter. Always. We have to try to be strong for each other. You still have me, and I'm not going anywhere. I promise. My beloved wife, Leah, had been tragically taken from us by a very rare disease a mere three weeks before. The illness came on suddenly and grew progressively worse with each passing day. Then she was gone. Just like that. By the time the doctors had figured out the cause of her illness, nothing could be done. It still felt as though she would come walking back through our door any moment, bringing the happiness and joy back into our lives that was so brutally taken from us. Our once affectionate and charismatic son, Carter, had not been dealing with the loss well. She was his whole world. I had never experienced a bond as powerful as the one shared between the two of them. He was completely and utterly devastated by her passing. He'd gone from a vibrant, playful, young adolescent boy to a withdrawn, detached shell of his former self. Being inside of our house was particularly difficult for him. He wanted nothing to do with our home aside from the necessity to shower or use the toilet. Not without his mother there. I certainly couldn't blame him for that. Much of the time, I didn't even know where he would go. But I knew he wasn't with any friends. No. He had shut them all out. Nevertheless, he'd been spending as much time as possible away from the house, and I wanted to bring him back. The plan for the treehouse was to allow him his escape but also to keep him near. I had purchased a kit from a local home improvement store and made rather short work of assembling it in our massive sycamore out back. Carter used to love to swing on the old tire swing that still hung proudly from one of its sturdy boughs. He initially rejected the idea of the treehouse. He was two months into his ninth year of life. A big boy. 
Big boys didn't need playhouses. Little boys did. Once those walls went up though, he virtually moved right in and stayed. His entire days were being spent in that treehouse. His nights too. I was amazed at his resolve to stay out of our house. Even so, I felt relief from having him near and knowing where he was. I had started bringing meals up to him in that tree, though his appetite still had not returned. On the occasions that he was away from the treehouse, I would load it up with snacks and bottles of water. Sadly, most of it remained untouched. I was worried about Carter. He couldn't possibly have carried on that way for much longer. My boy was in need of therapy. I suppose we both were, really. I knew that he wouldn't open up to any shrink. So I wanted to set him up with the next best thing, music. Music is medicine for the soul. I had decided to purchase an audio system that I could hook up to his treehouse. I wanted to surprise him. I wanted to ignite a spark inside of him that just might resemble happiness. That soothing ebb and flow of music interrupting the silence of his solitary treehouse life. Yeah, that's what the doctor would order. I had made arrangements with my sister, Joyce, to take Carter out to see the newest superhero movie so that I could get everything set up. I also hoped that maybe, just maybe the movie would make him forget his sadness, if only for a short time. While they were out, I installed the audio system and ran through some manufacturer's suggested tests. The sound quality was amazing, but the speakers were quite large and surprisingly heavy. I had concern over the integrity of the treehouse walls to support the weighty equipment. So I grabbed my nail gun and reinforced the treehouse walls with some of the extra lumber we kept stored in our shed. The system was fantastic. I knew he'd love it and I'd spared no expense when purchasing it. The anticipation I had for his reaction was substantial and growing stronger every minute. By that time, I knew the movie would have ended and they'd be on their way back. I love Carter so much, more than I've ever loved anyone. I would have given anything to see him smile again. I would have paid any price. I stood in the midst of this shattered, grief-stricken boy's house of silence looking over my attempt to bring him a tiny bit of healing with beautiful sound to fill his ears and hopefully his heart. A sad smile crossed my lips as I saw Joyce's car pull slowly into the driveway. There was my boy, my heart. As I looked back one final moment to make sure everything was perfect, a pair of hostile swallows hell-bent on destroying each other came barreling into the treehouse at full speed. The screeching cry of pain and fury that was erupting from those little bastards was damn near deafening. I bobbed and weaved in an attempt to dodge their violent maneuvers but wound up losing my footing just as those aggressive little assholes took their battle outside and to the ground. I went down hard, falling backward and crashing headfirst into the newly reinforced treehouse wall now boasting a shiny, expensive, and heavy speaker. The force of my head colliding with that wall caused the speaker to break away from the fasteners that were supposed to be holding it firmly in place. So much for those reinforcements. 
I had only a split second to make a move and jerked my body out from under the path of the falling speaker. I had narrowly escaped a broken nose or stitches in my head, but something stopped me abruptly, mid-movement. That speaker had missed my face, but somehow connected with my nail gun. In my attempt to dodge the birds, I must have knocked it to the floor. The two objects came together in the most intricate and impossible way. The one and only way that could actually trigger that son of a bitch. The thick steel nail sailed right through my throat, ripping it wide open along the way. Overwhelmed with disbelief, I watched as my life poured out of my body and pulled up on the floor. Once again, I was brought down on my back. Slowly this time. This final time. I marveled momentarily at the sequence of events that had just taken place. It must have been a dream. Only in nightmares could something so egregious really occur. I noticed a burning sensation in my neck but didn't feel any true pain. I was unable to draw breath and was quickly losing all sensations and control of my body. But I knew that I had to move. I had to somehow get out of there, to get help, to live. I summoned every last bit of energy and will that I had left in my near lifeless body. I had hoped to make at least one attempt to launch my body or even roll out of the treehouse. Joyce could save my life. She was a seasoned ER nurse at the county hospital. I needed only to get out and to become visible to her. But fate had far more twisted plans. There would be no miracle on this day. Instead, there would be only tragedy and more unbearable loss. I could no longer move or feel. I was fading quickly away. But the sound of a car door closing coupled with my sister's muffled voice rocketed me into a sudden, savage state of crystal clear awareness. The gravity of what was about to unfold hit me like the mighty fist of God. There was nothing on earth or in heaven that would be able to ease the unendurable weight of the catastrophic devastation that was about to inhabit my son. Joyce and Carter were in the backyard now, looking for me. They called out to me a couple of times, but I only really heard my boy. Strangely, I was aware of Joyce's presence, but it was as if I could no longer absorb her sounds. Only the voice of my son. Dad, where are you? Desperation and despair washed over me in those last moments like a raging wildfire. No, I cried out silently. Please, God, no. Don't take me away from Carter. God, he needs me. The anguish was immeasurable. Oh my God, please, no. Oh no. Oh God. Please, I'm all he has. No, 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 no. Are you up there, Dad? I could hear him then, making his way up the ladder of boards I nailed into the tree. On his way up to his safe place, his house of silence, his sanctuary. What had I done? God, why, why? I'm so sorry, Carter. Please forgive me. I'm so fucking sorry. <coughs> the wretched, agonizing scream of my dear, sweet, permanently broken boy pierced my heart with the deepest of all sorrow as the darkness swept my soul away. Thick gray mist surrounds me now. I feel no breeze. No heat and no chill. All is still. I felt aware of my surroundings and knew I was still existing, but where? Was this hell? It couldn't possibly be heaven. 
there's no way that they could let me in with the incredible sadness that I carry. I cannot part with it. It is me now, and I am it. The sadness and I are one. Slowly, the mist beneath me began to dissipate. I was able to make out a small room. I recognized this place as more of the scene before me came into focus. I began to fill with horror and terrible dread. I was still in the treehouse, floating just feet above my lifeless body. And Carter, I couldn't hear him. He was screaming furiously at my body, sobbing inconsolably. His face was so twisted and wrought with despair and he looked nothing like the son I had embraced just hours before. He fell forward and beat passionately on my chest. I didn't want to see this, but was unable to look away. I saw Joyce's head and shoulders appear in the doorway as she came to Carter's aid. I watched as her face filled with horror and she cried out. Then she was gone no doubt to get help. She left him there. Why would she leave him? She should have taken him away. I watched as an unnatural calm fell over him. He began to investigate the gruesome scene of my death, trying to put all the pieces together. It didn't take long before he found a nail embedded in one of the walls with meat from my neck and throat plastered all around it. He looked at the nail gun, then the speaker, and finally the wall where broken fasteners gleamed in a beam of sunlight coming in through a crack in the structure. It was evident that he got the gist of what happened, but he would never truly know how it happened. Carter sat staring at my body for a time. I wanted to go to him to hold him and tell him that everything was going to be okay, that he would make it through this and become the strongest man I had ever known. I wanted to tell him how much love he still has to look forward to, how the love for his children would trump even the love that he has for his parents. I wanted to tell him to hold on, that it's okay to cry and that his life would still be beautiful. I couldn't do any of these things, though. I was nothing more than an involuntary spectator. He leaned forward and picked up the nail gun, looking at it from every possible angle. He studied it. He was trying to figure out how something so insignificant and inanimate was able to take his father away from him. How this item was able to bring such suffering. It was nothing but a tool. The mist began to close in again. Apparently, my time was up. I could only watch in horror through the thickening mist as my son positioned the nail gun square against his temple, finger on the trigger. I was swallowed up by darkness once more as one terrible sound was permitted to penetrate the deafening silence of this place. The all too familiar sound of a single nail fired from a nail gun. The sound tore through my soul, now bitter and empty. The only sound worse than my newfound silence. Sanctuary, written by Christina Wilson, performed by Warren Richardson as the father, and Patrick Mealy as Carter. Sound design and audio engineering was by me, Jason Wilson, and the musical score was by the maestro himself, J.M. Scherf. If you would like to submit a story for consideration for the conclusion of season two, please send your first story. Now, I don't mean the first one you wrote two or ten years ago. I mean your first story ever. New authors only. 
please. So, if you know someone who would like to enter a story for consideration, please tell them about our first ever author uh, program. Yeah. And have them submit their story. However, pay attention. We will tell you when to submit these stories. So, don't do it today, but soon. And have them submit that to submissions at thegrayrooms.com. And put the first-time author in the topic line. Also, a max of 3,000 words for these stories, and you know how they have to end. <laughs> so thank you for your time, and there will be more coming for you very, very soon. So we'll see you in a few weeks. <laughs>